welcome Melinda. Better. We got to do better than that. That's better. Okay, so we are going to dive right in here in just a minute. But if you picked up your notes sheet coming in, um, you'll notice that we have a much abbreviated review section. We are going to do a little bit of review, but it's very abbreviated because we have a little bit of an unusual lesson tonight. It is obviously chapter 13 in your book, so if you read it, you know about that. Um, but we're looking, instead of looking at just a, a, a story or um, a passage, we're looking at an individual, and it, this chapter pulls from a lot of different places to talk about what happens in the life and reign of that individual. And so we got a lot of ground to cover, and I know that's not shocking to any of you who know me that I usually have a lot uh, to say. So for that purpose, I hope that it's what God has given me to share with you, and I'm very grateful. I want to say even now, though he's not here, thank you to Brother David for entrusting uh, these very important moments to me, and you all have carved out of a very busy schedule time to be here, and so I am appreciative of this opportunity. So um, with that in mind, let's look at these just four quick review questions, the first three of which should just be like embedded into your brain by now because we've read over these, we've looked at them, we've talked about them um, over and over and over again, so it should just about be second nature to you now. So number one is the main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things, right? So We've learned from that that when something is unclear, we don't want to get too far off into the weeds because that's not some of the main message that God is speaking to us through his word. Then number two, the Bible is one big story about our great big God. And so though it is many individual books written by many different people over a lot of years, it is still all part of God's larger narrative, the story that he is communicating ultimately about himself. And then number three, God is always working to bring order out of chaos, right? And we'll talk specifically about that in tonight's lesson again. And then the sin cycle, which is the most recent thing that we've talked about, is that um, historically in Bible times all the way to today, um, there's this cycle that we get caught up in. We rebel, we sin, and that produces what? Servitude or bondage. When the suffering of that servitude gets great enough, we cry out to God, there's supplication, and in his grace and mercy, he provides a way of escape or salvation. And so um, that's all that we're going to do in the way of review. And as we get prepared to look specifically at tonight's uh, lesson, I'm not going to go all the way back to um, the very beginning in the garden. Um, that would take us way too long. But to get to where we are in the narrative right now tonight, just to give you some context for that, let's just go back to Father Abraham. So we know that God called Abraham to be the father of the nation of Israel, and the nation of Israel had as her job to point all other nations to God. And so God chooses from among all the peoples on the earth a people to be his own. And through those people, it is his design and plan to reveal himself to the rest of the world. And so he gives them land and he allows them, wasn't necessarily um, the original design, but he allows them to have kings. And then we've learned in just recent weeks that Saul, the first king of Israel, uh, failed miserably in his role as king. And so God said, I'm going to choose a man after my own heart, and he will ascend the throne and follow King Saul. Now, we learned last week that though David sinned grievously, he repented, and God used him to um, govern the nation of Israel, God's people, effectively. And during his reign, he essentially subdued all of the enemies of the people of Israel. Now, before we dive into this week's lesson, I want to just remind us of one thing. Any time that you encounter a key character in the scriptures, all of the key players in God's story of redemption and restoration are there to point us 
to a coming king. So they are fathers of our faith like Abraham. They are deliverers like Moses. They are leaders like David. But what they all have in common is that they are flawed human beings whose lives ultimately declare to us someone better is coming a better father, a better deliverer, a better leader. And so just know that when you encounter a key character in Scripture, that story is never ultimately about them. It's always ultimately about him. And so that's how we want to read all of Scripture is what does this say first and foremost about God? And then we can move on to the secondary truths that we learn. So... We pick up with our reading this week in chapter 13 of the story, and we find that David, King David, is on his deathbed. He is preparing to pass the baton of leadership to the next king. Now, remember we've talked about how there are events playing along down here on the lower level, but there's an upper story that is governing, if you will, all of these events down on the lower level. And so the upper story, what we know about that is that the promised Messiah will come from the tribe of Judah and he will sit on the throne of David. So when we see David preparing to pass that baton on, we know that it's going to be one of his sons who is going to ascend the throne after him. What's a little bit unexpected is which son it will be, not because of who it was, but because of some of the um, events surrounding his birth. So we know, and hopefully if you read this week, who is David going to pass the baton of leadership onto? Solomon, his son Solomon. And you may say, well, why is that unexpected? Well, Solomon was born from David's relationship with who? Bathsheba. Now, he was not the child that was conceived uh, through the adulterous and rape-like relationship. We know that as, as part of God's judgment, that child died, but Solomon comes later. However, think about all of the chaos that surrounded David's relationship with Bathsheba the lust and the adultery and even essentially the rape and then the murder and the cover-up and all of that chaos. And yet we know, just, just like we saw in our notes, God is always working to bring order from chaos. And so Solomon, who ultimately is a later child born out of that very relationship, ends up rising to the throne to rule over Israel. And so the reality is sin is devastating and it is destructive but it will never derail God's divine purposes let me say that again because that is good news for you and for me sin is very destructive and it is devastating but it will never derail God's divine purposes now this is incredibly good for you and for me because what that says to us is Nothing is irredeemable when God is writing the story. So no matter what may have happened to you, no matter what you may have done, no matter what your current set of circumstances might be, nothing is irredeemable when God is writing that story. And so as we pick up with our look at Solomon, David is, has, has passed on, he has subdued all of the en- uh, enemies of Israel, and Solomon rises to the throne. And of course, because David had been the man of bloodshed that he was, and the enemies were subdued, Solomon rises in a period of, rises to the throne in a period of uh, peace and prosperity, essentially. Now, Solomon is largely known, even by people who are not students of scripture, people who are not uh, churchgoers or people of faith, he is largely known for two things. You want to take a stab at what those are? Wisdom. Anybody want to guess on the other one? Solomon's temple. So his wisdom and his temple are the two things that he's largely known for. Now, We're going to be looking at the life and reign of Solomon. And as I said before, we're kind of going to be bouncing back and forth between several different books of the Bible. And I just wanted to remind you that the scripture is arranged 
topically and not always chronologically. I don't know how far along I was in my reading of Scripture before I realized some of the reasons why this doesn't all seem to make sense in a chronological way is because it didn't happen in the order that we're sometimes reading if we read straight through Scripture. So the events of Solomon are recorded primarily in 1 Kings and in 2 Chronicles. And so I don't know if you did your homework this week, uh, the way Brother David's been telling you, you know, jot down in the margins where those verses came from. If you did, you deserve a gold star because it was passages from 1 Kings, and then it was 2 Chronicles, and then it was back to 1 Kings, and of course we look at Proverbs in there too. Um, and so we're going to be bouncing around in those places in your storybook and in Scripture to identify um, this, these characteristics of Solomon and these events that surround his life. Uh, now we also know that Solomon wrote Song of Songs, which in my growing up days we called that Song of Solomon, and then we also know that he may have written Ecclesiastes, um, but we're not for certain about that. Those two books we will not be considering tonight, Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs. So before we dive in too much into Solomon's wisdom, I want you to go ahead, if you've got your storybook there or your scriptures, um, this is page 176, and it is from 1 Kings 3.1. And what we learn is that right out of the gate, I mean, Solomon has just barely begun his reign as king, and right out of the gate, he is already coloring outside the lines, if you will. We read that he has married outside of Israel. Now, we're going to talk more about that a little bit later, but just know that that was a no-no, and he married outside of Israel. So it's an incident that sets a precedent. At this point, it's just one event, an incident, but it comes back to play at the end of his life. And so it's an incident that sets a precedent. And then he also sacrificed at the high places. What that means is he was worshiping and leading worship for the people of Israel of the one true God, but he was incorporating elements of the worship of the foreign gods, of the false gods worshipped by the lands around Israel. And that essentially is um, partial obedience, which we've been learning is equivalent to what? Disobedience. And it's going to come back to haunt Solomon later on in the story. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's dive in and talk a little bit about his wisdom, Solomon's wisdom. So many of you will recall that God comes to Solomon and says, you can have anything that you want. Ask me for a long life, for health, whatever you want. And we know that Solomon, in his humility, asks God for wisdom. And so if you look at the top of page 177, this is actually out of 1 Kings 3, this was Solomon's response when God says, ask for anything. He said, O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, your servant, give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and distinguish between right and wrong. And then he closes out, for who is able to govern this great people of yours? So Solomon in his initial humility recognizes, I'm not up to the task. This job is too big for me. And so we, we read later in the book of Proverbs where Solomon himself recorded these words in chapter 11. <clears throat> With pride comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. And that's because humility is always a prerequisite for wisdom. Because we have to recognize we're not up to the task. We need guidance and help from God in order to meet the objective set before us. And so I want to give you, we're not going to land here for too long, but I want to give you kind of a wordy definition for wisdom. And this is one of those things that will be for you to uh, take home and maybe chew on at a later time because we can't really parse all this out uh, right now. But I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. Wisdom that God gives to Solomon is skill to consistently apply common sense with a discerning spirit, so it's not just your everyday common sense, there's discernment there, and it's learned from experience or trusted mentors filtered through the word 
and the will of God leading to optimal success in life. So that's the wisdom that God granted to Solomon in response to his humble request. Now, we know that this wisdom was ultimately granted to Solomon. God said, you know what? I'm going to give you wisdom, and then I'm going to give you all those other things that you didn't ask for, the, the wealth and the long life and the health and all that good stuff. And so we see in Scripture this wisdom that God gave to Solomon introduced and, and kind of illustrated for us in a very bizarre and unique event that hopefully you read about this week and maybe you've even heard this um, read or studied multiple times before but it's a really kind of a strange event that takes place so we're going to call it two prostitutes and a baby and so we know that two women that were identified as prostitutes thank you two women that are identified as prostitutes come to uh, they both have babies so there's two babies to begin with one of the babies dies, and so they both fight over whose baby it is. They both say it's their baby. And so in order to um, have this problem resolved, they bring their situation before King Solomon, and they're going back and forth, it's my baby, no, it's my baby, no, it's my baby. And Solomon says, wait a minute, I have a solution to the problem. And this wasn't just Solomon having like a clever answer to this, you know, Deliver, you know, this problem, this dilemma or whatever. This was Solomon exercising his God-given wisdom that he, he could understand the inner workings of the human heart and how it impacts our human relationships because what he knew is that when an individual is governed by love of others the way a mother would be for her baby, it's characterized by self-sacrifice. But when an individual is governed by love of self, it's characterized by greed. And so in this decision, Solomon demonstrates this great God-given wisdom and he accurately interprets the, the facts that are put before him. And so what happens is we read about how after these events take place, in 1 Kings 3 it says, all Israel saw that in Solomon was this wisdom from God. So God begins to do something with Solomon. Then all of Israel takes note of it. And then in chapter 4 of First Kings, um, it says in two different places, his fame began to spread to all the surrounding nations and they came to hear his wisdom. Here's a pattern that I want you to take note of because it is all throughout Scripture right down to our very lives today. And that is God revealing himself to his people in order to then reveal himself through his people. This goes back to the patriarchs. This occurs with Moses, with David, with Solomon, and even down to where we live today. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be hearing from our pastor out of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and glorify who? Not you, because of your good works. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And so God has always been and will always be about the business of revealing himself to his people. Not so that it's an end in and of itself. He works in us not just for the benefit that it is to us, but so that he can then work through us and through his people. And so... The wisdom of Solomon, of course, has been collected in one of the books of our Bible, and it is, of course, the book of Proverbs. And so there's a, a spattering of Proverbs that's in the storybook for us, for us to kind of just glean some truth there. And so we know that Solomon wrote about 3,000 Proverbs, um, over 1,000 songs, and in these Proverbs, he covers every topic from horticulture to human relationships, um, marriage and money and child rearing and everything in between. But essentially, what Proverbs is giving us is practical insight for how to live a life that honors God. And so this is covered, the ones that are in your storybook are from uh, pages 179 to 183. Now, let me just toss out, 
Proverbs does very much have what's referred to as transcovenantal application or implication, meaning that even though we are living um, under the new covenant, obviously there's a ton of wisdom to glean from the book of Proverbs for us. However, occasionally you will encounter a cultural um, word or concept or trend that won't really completely make the translation real easily. And it, it can be confusing because we have to always remember whatever we're reading in Scripture that it was originally intended for a different audience. And we have to go back and say, who was the original audience here? And so we know that for Proverbs, the original audience were the children of Israel living in the Promised Land. So that's why you're going to hear some some um, cultural uh, references and some terms that don't completely make the journey with us to where we live today. Now, the primary purpose of the book of Proverbs is to teach us what the fear of the Lord looks like. Twelve times in the book of Proverbs is the phrase, the fear of the Lord, most notably in chapter 1, verse 7, and then again in chapter 9, verse 10. And this fear of the Lord is not a, you know, cowering in dread of, of a God who could smash us like bugs, even though he could. But this concept of the fear of the Lord means this. It's reverential awe that comes from a knowledge of God that leads to obedience. So when we know God, not just know about him, but we know him, we know his character, we know his nature, that produces in us a reverence and an awe that then prompts us to desire to obey him. And so Proverbs is teaching us what does that look like to live in the fear of the Lord. Now, this is totally a Melinda thing, but I'm teaching, so I'm going to take, you know, that, that privilege for myself. Um, if I had to pick what I would refer to as the thesis of the book of Proverbs, it would be in chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. And this is on page 179 in your book. So if you'll look there, I should have left my book open. But page 179, kind of towards the bottom. And this is what Solomon writes. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand, there's our phrase, the fear of the Lord, and you will find the knowledge of God. And so Solomon says, knowing God that results in wisdom and understanding and insight um, and all of those things. This, this knowing God is the result of a passionate pursuit of God, primarily in his word. Now, God reveals himself to us in other ways, but his primary means of revealing himself is in his word. And so what you find here in this little passage that I'm kind of referring to as the thesis of Proverbs is an if then statement. Now, some promises in scripture are unconditional. God says something and he's going to do it and it doesn't matter what anybody else does. It doesn't matter our, it doesn't hinge on our faithfulness or obedience. It is absolutely unconditionally going to happen. But there are other promises God makes that are conditional and some of them are conditioned upon what we do. And this is an example of an if-then statement where God says, I want to do something for you. I'm going to reveal myself. I'm going to allow you to experience knowledge of me, but you have a part to play in this too. He promises that we will know the fear of the Lord and we will discover what it means to really know God. But he says, but your part, my part, is to passionately pursue him. There are no less than eight verbs in this little passage that talk about what God is calling us to do if we want to know him. Words like accept, store up, turn, apply, call, cry out loud, and it goes on and on and on. And so uh, the pursuit, the promise is God, God's, but the pursuit must be ours. Now, I want you to notice Solomon 
describes this wisdom and this understanding, this, this knowing God through his word as hidden treasure. Is that how we see it? Is that how we view searching for God in his word? Because we're willing to leverage great time and energy when we believe that the return will exceed our investment, right? And so the takeaway from this thesis in the book of Proverbs, and we see it over and over throughout the book, is that our devotion to Scripture will directly correspond to the value we ascribe to it. Our devotion to God's Word and to pursuing Him in the Scripture will always have a direct correlation to the value that we ascribe to it. So, for example, if it's a treasure to you, if digging into the Scriptures to look for your Savior those threads of redemption woven throughout the scripture, if it is a treasure to you, then it will be a delight for you to carve out of your busy schedule even just a few moments to seek the Lord in his word. But if it's a task, you know, Brother David talked last week about uh, the guy that talked about it being, you know, just something that I check off the list. If it's a task for you, it will feel a lot more like a duty than a delight. It will be a drudgery. Oh, that we would discover the treasure that is hidden away for us if we would do the work of excavating it in the scriptures. So one other thing before we leave the wisdom and the Proverbs and move on to, to his temple. One thing that I think is really important in Proverbs but also in other parts of scripture is to distinguish between a principle and a promise. Promises are um, going to be fulfilled 100% of the time. Now, I already kind of mentioned how some promises are conditional. So we're talking about unconditional promises. They are fulfilled and they come to pass 100% of the time. You can absolutely take a promise to the bank, right? Principles, on the other hand, state general truths. So they are going to state things that are generally true, but not in every single situation in every person's life. And so if we are not careful, if we confuse these two, if we read something in scripture that was intended as a principle, but we believe it's a promise, and then it doesn't happen the way we read it, that can lead to disillusionment. In fact, it can, it can cause us to get angry with God and to resent God and to doubt God. And so let me give you some examples. Several of these are actually out of chapter 3, which is in your storybook. The first two verses of chapter 3 say that obedience leads to long life and prosperity. I would dare say that every one of us in this room knows somebody that we believed to be a person who honored God, who obeyed God, and in our estimation, their life was cut short. What do we do with that if we take this to be a promise when it was meant to be a principle? And so then again in verses 7 and 8 of chapter 3, it says to fear God and avoid evil ensures good health. Same thing. Verses 9 and 10 of chapter 3 says if you honor God with your resources, it will produce great wealth. And then probably... One of the most confused principles that is taken to be a promise is in chapter 22, verse 6. And it says, if you raise up a child in the way he should go, when he is old, he will not depart from it. We have to be careful when we read the word of God to understand when it's a promise and when it's a principle so that we will not become disillusioned um, when Perhaps it doesn't happen in every single case. All right, so let's move on to the temple, the other thing that Solomon is most known for aside from his wisdom. So this is going to harken back a fair amount to some conversation that we've already had about the tabernacle when Moses was with the children of Israel and they were moving from place to place. And so God wanted to be among his people, but they weren't staying in one place, right? And so he instructed them to build the tabernacle or to, to 
create the tabernacle, if you will, and it had poles and it had all of the utensils and it had stuff that was easy to pick up when God said go. They could fold up those curtains and pack up the utensils and get the rods and they could hit the road, right? But it was to be the dwelling place of God among his people. That's what the word tabernacle means is dwelling. And so now we fast forward to Solomon and he's going to build a more permanent place for God to dwell. Now God is establishing his people in the land. There's going to be a centralized location for worship, and so the temple is going to be built, but it is for the same purpose as the tabernacle, and essentially it even followed the same pattern in its layout. And so what we learn and what we see here as a pattern that actually goes back before the tabernacle and it will continue after is this pattern of God condescending to be with his people. When I was in high school, there was a a familiar song that some of you will recognize this line, but there was this one line in the song that said, God is watching us from where? Nobody knows this song. God is watching us from a distance. Never has there been a more untrue statement. God has never been content or satisfied to relate to his people from afar, to keep a safe distance. He has always been about condescending to be with his people. Heaven essentially coming to earth to bridge that gap. In Exodus 3, 8, when Moses is at the burning bush, God says to him, I have come down to rescue my people. And then in Exodus 19, when Moses is receiving uh, the Ten Commandments on the top of Mount Sinai, this is what he writes about that event. He says, the Lord descended on Mount Sinai, and then the ultimate condescension of God prophesied in Isaiah 7, and then we read about its fulfillment in Matthew chapter 1 is the incarnation of Christ, where we read that he was to be called Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. And so God longs to be with his people. And so as Solomon builds this more permanent structure, it is for the same purpose and with the same pattern as the tabernacle to be with his people. And so there's some preparation that takes place in 1 Kings chapter 5. This is on 183 and 184 in your book. We're not going to really look too deeply there. But I just want to toss out that we can see the wisdom that God has given Solomon in his negotiating expertise because he arranges this deal where Israel will provide food, wheat, and olive oil in exchange for wood that's going to come from a neighboring country. And so the wood, of course, is going to be part of what they use for the construction project in building the temple. And so in 1 Kings 6, we have the um, construction process detailed for us. In your book, the storybook, if you'll look at the bottom of page 184, we're going to look at this italicized section here. But remember, the things that are in italics in the storybook are like a bunch of stuff that's squished into a paragraph or so. So there's a whole lot more detail and intricacy that is described for us in the construction of this massive, enormous, um, exquisite building that was to be for God's dwelling. And so what we learn is on the bottom of page 184 that it was a modest footprint, 90 feet by 30 feet, but of spectacular beauty, historic significance. And then on up on the top of the next page, it says, the ark of God was placed in the most holy place where entry was limited to the high priest. The floor plan of Solomon's temple followed the pattern of the tabernacle. There it is. And then it says it took seven years to build the temple. Now, you might initially think at, at that size, well, maybe they were short on workers, But then we read that there was 180,000 conscripted laborers and nearly 4,000 supervisors on this building project. So this is like an extravagant building 
before an extravagant God. This is a spare-no-expense project. If you read the detailed descriptions, you know that everything in that place practically is covered in what? Gold. It's all covered in gold. And so I want to just toss out something, and it's not just here that we see this, but we have to be careful about making parallels where no parallel was intended to be made in Scripture. That can get us into a lot of trouble. And so this idea that this spare no expense because it's the house of God, it's, it's the dwelling place of God, has kind of been carried over into the modern church. And I have heard plenty of arguments made that range from, well, we can't bring coffee in the worship center because this is God's house. All the way to, well, money should be no object for the chandelier that's going to be in the foyer because this is the house of the Lord. We have to be really careful because the problem with that is modern church buildings are not for God. They're for us. Church buildings are not God's house. The believer's body is now the house of God. 1 Peter 2.5 says, You yourselves are living stones, a spiritual house. And then 1 Corinthians 3, a very familiar passage, says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you had read all of those verses and verses and verses and verses that detail all that went into the construction and the building of the temple, and all the wealth that was collected, and the gold that overlaid everything. After considering the enormous time and energy and resource that went into the building of the temple, and now realizing that you are that temple, this speaks to your great worth and value. God spared no expense for you. Brother David read this verse a few weeks ago, but in 1 Peter 1 it says, For you know that you were redeemed not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. And so Solomon does the preparation and then there's the construction. And once the temple is built, there's this massive dedication and celebration that happens as they dedicate the temple of God. And so we, we read in 2 Chronicles 5-7 that right before they dedicate, kind of the finishing touches, so to speak, is that the ark of God, the ark of the covenant, comes to rest in the most holy place beneath the wings of the cherubim. So just like it was in the tabernacle, the ark comes to its resting place. Now, Bear with me because some of this may be slightly repetitive, but I want us to make sure we get the Jesus connection to what's going on here because that essentially is what the story is all about, seeing the thread of redemption throughout all of Scripture. And so we know that in the Old Testament, the high priest, whether you're talking about the tabernacle or the temple, the high priest would go into that most holy place, the holy of holies, to meet with God and to offer sacrifices on what was called the mercy seat or the atonement cover. It was the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And what we read about back in the, the tabernacle days God says to Moses, beneath these gold cherubim, that's where I'm going to meet with the high priest. And he tells Aaron to slaughter a goat and sprinkle the blood of that goat on the atonement cover because that would be a propitiation or a satisfying of God's wrath for one more year. And so fast forward to the book of Romans chapter 3 verse 25 and it says Christ is our propitiation a word that is only used one other time in the New Testament in Hebrews and there guess what it's translated as atonement cover used exactly the same as those 20 some odd times that the Hebrew word in the Old Testament is used for that lid 
to the Ark of the Covenant where the priest would meet and offer the blood for one more year. Now, what does that have to do with us? Let's bridge the gap between the Old Covenant and the New. What we learn from that is Christ is our atonement cover, the place where we meet with God. And our sin is atoned for not once a year, but once a year. And for all. That's why when Jesus was talking with the woman at the well, she wanted to kind of stir up an argument, kind of a conversation about the place of worship, right? She said, well, now my people think that we have to worship at this mountain and your people say it's that mountain and what, you know, which is it? And Jesus says, no, 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 no. I want to talk to you about a time. And he referred to a time that would happen as a result of his death, burial, and resurrection. And he said, there's going to be a time when worship is no longer centered in a place, but in a person. And it's me. That's also why two chapters before, in John chapter 2, Jesus walked beside the temple. Now, it wasn't the temple of Solomon. It was Herod's temple. And he said, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. And they said, whoa, it took over 40 years to build that temple. And, and we know that Jesus ultimately did not speak of a building, but of his body. And so what, a, what an amazing Jesus thread or connection between, and of course, we don't have time to get into all this, but on and on they could go about the veil that hung in the temple, and we know that that represented the, the, the sin that separated us from God. And then we know what happened to the veil when Jesus breathed his last. It was torn in two because he became sin for us, and his body was broken like the veil was torn. And so there's all kinds of Jesus connection to what's being put into the temple. So back to the dedication. So the people of God are celebrating this permanent dwelling place of God. And so they break out the best clothes. The priests put on their linen garments. The musical instruments are um, everywhere. There's 120 priests that are blowing trumpets. And there are singers. And they begin to worship God And in their worship, just like in our worship, hopefully, they begin to speak of or or declare qualities of God that were worthy of praise, attributes of God. And first, they begin to declare his faithfulness. And they sing, he is good. His love endures forever. This is in 2 Chronicles 5 and 7 that they, they sing this refrain, he is good. His love endures forever. Now, this is, this is pretty significant because in their history and in their future, these people will give God every reason to reject them. But they can declare that God is good and that his love is eternal because his love and his goodness are not dependent upon our obedience or the faithfulness of Israel, it was dependent upon the character and the unchanging nature of God. God cannot violate his own nature. And so that refrain would become part of a familiar psalm. It's Psalm 136, where um, it's believed to be that, that it spoke about the steadfast love of God in such a powerful way that it was incorporated into um, corporate worship of the people of Israel. And so the priest would make a statement about God. And then the Levitical choir would echo back this refrain, He is good. His love endures forever. Now, this is a declaration, but I think it's also a reminder to themselves. Because I'm going to tell you, when you read the story of God's people, you have to know that there were times when they did not feel his love, when they did not see his goodness And so they would sing, he is good, his love endures forever, not just as a declaration, but as a reminder to themselves that when circumstances say otherwise, when there's that voice telling me something different, this is what is true. It it makes me think of a couple of times in the book of Psalms because we need to follow their example and speak to ourselves about what is true of God. In Psalm 103, The psalmist says, bless the Lord, O my soul, 
and forget not all his benefits. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but he's talking to himself. He's saying, bless the Lord, soul, so that you won't forget all of the great benefits. And then in Psalm 43, he says, why are you so downcast, my soul? Put your hope in God because he is your salvation. We need to learn to talk to ourselves about what is true of God so that it will carry us through those moments when we don't feel it and when we don't see it. And so they declared the faithfulness of God and then we see the forgiveness of God show up in their worship experience. So Solomon starts off by saying, God, you know, even the heavens cannot contain you, much less this temple. We certainly cannot confine God in a building or a box of our own making, but what we can do and what these people did is claim his promises. Solomon said, God, you said that if we would pray that you would hear us. See, while we can't bind God by our own ideologies or mental constructs, what he will be bound by is his word. He will never violate his word. And that's why at the bottom of page 187, I believe it is, it says, not one word has failed of all his good promises. And so that's why Solomon prays, oh God, you said that if we prayed you would hear and when you hear, this is what we need you to do. We need you to forgive. Solomon foresaw already that they were not far away from failing God again and again and again. And he said, God, when you hear, we need you to forgive because that is the one thing needed for God's people to dwell with him. Though it would be achieved for them only in a very incomplete and temporary fashion until the ultimate sacrificial lamb would come to our rescue. And so as they have worshipped and celebrated God and, and they've declared his faithfulness and his forgiveness, then we see the glory of God move into the temple. In 2 Chronicles 5 and 7, it says, The glory of the Lord filled the temple. And in chapter 7, it says, When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. God's presence, God condescended to be with his people, and the result was the priests could not even go into the temple and perform their duties. And it says people knelt with their faces to the ground. And this is where we read the second refrain of, he is good, his love endures forever. Now something that I noticed that I've never seen before here that I think is, is intentional and profound is in this dedication ceremony, as the glory of God comes down and the people sing to God, we see this divine collision between the goodness and the greatness of God. We see the goodness in the song they're singing. He is good, his love endures forever. But then we see the greatness when the fire falls from heaven and God displays his splendor and his power and his majesty. And we, we take away from that an understanding that these two attributes of God, his goodness and his greatness, they are complementary, not contradictory, as we are often inclined to think. Some of you will remember those first few lines of a very familiar blessing that we would say around the table. God is great. God is good. But then life moves on and we grow into adults and we see how messed up this world is. We see injustice all around us. Tragedy strikes maybe just near you or maybe it lands right at your doorstep and you feel squeezed into a, backed into a corner where you're forced to choose. Well, it must be one or the other, but surely it can't be both. Either he's good and he doesn't want these bad things to be happening, but he's just unable. He's powerless to do anything about it. Or he's powerful, and because he won't do anything to prevent these horrible things, maybe he's just not good, like I thought he was. Some of you may be familiar with a, a, a recent song that Crowder has put out that really echoes this essential tension 
necessary for worship, and it is the song, Good God Almighty. And, and I love it because it almost makes me think of what we were just talking about with the echoing of the, the worship leader, the, the priest, and then the Levitical choir, because in the bridge of this song, he says, tell me, is he good? And it echoes back, he's good. Tell me, is he God? And there's this echo, he's God. And then all together, he is good God Almighty. He's both. And only when we can experience a marriage between the goodness and the greatness of God are we able to experience trust in our Father that results ultimately in a a relationship of intimacy. He is both good and he is great. And so at the end sort of of this dedication, after the glory of God falls, then God speaks. He makes a response. He initially responds uh, by saying, I have heard your prayer. And then he goes on to talk to his people as a, as a group collectively. And he says uh, that very, very familiar passage in Second Chronicles where he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. And so he's essentially saying, okay, here's my commitment to you. I will respond to your humble repentance. And then he says to Solomon, if you are faithful, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne. But then God, foreseeing the unfaithfulness of his people, says to an unfaithful people, I will uproot you from the land and I will reject this temple. Those were two of the most central aspects of the worship of Israel, the land and the temple, because the land represented their inheritance and the temple represented the presence of God. And so here again, we see a thread throughout scripture. Sin brings separation. All the way back in the Garden of Eden, when God says, in the moment that you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. They didn't immediately die in their bodies, but their spirit died, and they were banished from Eden in exile. And then we see it over and over in the story of God's people in the Old Testament. They would rebel against him, and they would be taken captive by foreign lands, and they would be in exile. And then even we see it in the New Testament in the book of Romans, the wages of sin is death, both physical and eternal, but also that separation from God, that exile. And so uh, that brings us to what we're not going to really dabble too much in tonight, but in 1 Kings 10, we see his fame, the fame of Solomon. And so essentially, um, people come from all over the world. This is where you read about the Queen of Sheba coming, and and people want to see his wealth. They want to hear his wisdom. And again, what we know about Solomon and Israel is God was esteeming them in the eyes of the world so that he could make his name great among all the peoples of the earth. But that is not how Solomon's story ended. That brings us to his downfall. In 1 Kings 11, it says Solomon loved many foreign women. Now, we've talked about this, and I know that right at the outset, the many disturbs us in that phrase, right? But we've learned that the many is what? What do we call it? Anybody remember? It is descriptive of life for those people. Polygamy was descriptive. It was not sanctioned by God. It brought a lot of trouble. But that's not really the most problematic thing here. It says Solomon loved many, what kind of women? Foreign women. What was prescriptive from the very beginning for God's people was you are not to marry outside of the nation of Israel. We read in Deuteronomy 7 that God told them if you, if you take uh, daughters for your sons in marriage or vice versa from the foreign lands, the worship of their gods will become a snare to you. And so we, we really can even go further back than that. If you remember the story of Abraham, remember how he sends his servant to, back to his homeland to find a wife for Isaac because he says, lest he take a wife from among the Canaanites where we are living. And then when they are about to go into the promised land yet again, Joshua says to them, listen, One more time. Let's see if we can get this straight. Don't marry 
from the foreign nations, it will be to your detriment and to your destruction. Now, here is another place where people have sometimes made a parallel where it was not intended. This was never about race. This was always about religion. This was never about the color of skin. It was about the object of worship. God said, you do not marry outside of your people so that you can preserve faithfulness to the one true God and that you will be a beacon then of light to the rest of the world. Now, at the bottom of page 191, we read the story continue exactly as we would expect. It says Solomon's wives led him astray. It happened just like God said it would. The worship and the intermingling and intermarriage of the foreign women, his heart was turned away from God. And it says Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. It was not, well, let me back up and say, say this. Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. We get that part of that verse, right? He did not follow the Lord. But then it says he, he wasn't like his father David who followed the Lord completely. Okay, that could be a little confusing because we just spent a pretty fair amount of time last week talking about the grievous sin that King David engaged in. But this is, this is huge. This is important. It was not sin but repentance that distinguished David from Solomon. It was not his sin. They both sinned and grievously. It was repentance that distinguished David from Solomon. We don't have any record of Solomon repenting of his sin, and that's what brings us to his end. It says the Lord became angry with Solomon because he followed other gods. He had a divided heart, and that led to a divided kingdom that is going to come in the weeks ahead as we look at the next chapters of the story. He had a divided heart that led to a divided kingdom but with a redemptive thread of promise that is in every act of God's judgment, there is always this redemptive thread of promise. And so this is what we read. Um, this is God speaking to Solomon, and he says, I'm not going to tear the kingdom from you for the sake of your father David. It's going to come from your son. But even then, he says, I will not tear the whole kingdom from him but I will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. So sin has consequences. It's devastating and destructive, but what was your first blank? It will never derail God's divine purposes. And so this is what we read as we land the plane here, um, wrapping up. In 2 Samuel 7, this was God's promise to David. He said, when your time comes and you die, I'm going to raise up after you your descendant. He'll come from your body, and I'll establish his kingdom. He says, he's the one that will build a house for me. And he says, I will be his father, and he will be my son. And when he does wrong, I will discipline him with a rod of men and blows from mortals. But my faithful love I will never take from him as I did when I removed it from Saul. Your house and your kingdom will endure before me forever, and your throne will be established forever. We know that that throne pointed to another time, another place, another person. It pointed to a throne that would ultimately belong to the lion of the tribe of Judah the one tribe that God preserved for the sake of David. I hope that you have gotten just a glimpse again tonight of this big story about a great big God that all points to the redemptive work of Christ that we 
celebrate in a unique and special way over the course of Holy Week as we contemplate and think about um, what this week meant in the life of our Lord. Obviously, I, uh, you know, we always cliche say, you know, it ought to be like Easter every day, and it should be. But we as believers have this week set aside to revisit what that scarlet thread of redemption that is woven throughout Scripture means for us individually, and it is a beautiful thing. And so I challenge you, make that time in Scripture uh, a treasure as you unfold the truths of God. Let's pray together. God, we do thank you so much for your great love for us. We thank you that you are great, but you are also good. And God, I pray that you would open our hearts this week as we contemplate and consider this week in the life of your son. Help us to uh, absorb and, and meditate on what that really means for us as believers. And I pray that we would not one moment of one day take for granted what you have done on our behalf. Thank you, good God Almighty. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for joining us tonight.